people of God, bow your hearts with me. God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, lover, liberator, life giver, be with us now in Christ's name. Amen. Dancer, director, and producer Debbie Allen tells a story of her early beginnings as a dance student in segregated Houston, Texas. As a black girl, despite her ability, her burgeoning interest and skills, she wasn't allowed to attend the most prestigious performing arts academies. But Debbie would find a way to watch. She tells the story of peering into the window of one of these forbidden studios and Patrick Swayze's mom, Patsy, one of its teachers, seeing her and inviting her in. No matter what the rules of their time indicated, Patsy adjusted them to make space for this little girl at the studio window. A little girl, the rules said, should not be allowed in. Patsy made the loving choice to alter the rules, to make space for her, to nurture her love of dance, to give her a chance. Now the world at this time with its rigid and inflexible rules said there was no place for a black student like her. But on that day and for many years following at this small studio, the rules were broken to allow Debbie and others like her in. Debbie says she follows that example and ultimately credits it as something that transformed her life opening her arms wide to every student she encounters. That single decision, Patsy's decision, that choice has been a blessing to the thousands of children who now attend the Debbie Allen Dance Academy. There's a whole lot going on in this text as you've heard Michael just read for us. There's historical inconsistencies and perhaps the beautiful and life-sustaining practice of gleaning leaving something behind for those who will come after you. Perhaps that's there. But I'm mining the scripture today for something more, something that might be useful to us right now. Everything is about choices. Using a teaching on Sabbath, our gospel reading shares a story like Debbie's about everyday decisions, how our response to everyday opportunities makes all the difference how our wrestling, our faithful negotiations between theory and reality, our wrestling with the world as it is and the way we know it should be, help us in the work of love, even and especially when it's hard, when we're hurting. We've talked about Sabbath in this community. Sabbath itself is a divine law or provision created to meet our human needs. Here we understand our need for it. But beyond a time of self-care, our reading pushes us to explore the option of outward-facing service, of supporting and doing what is right, simply because it's right for ourselves and others, of consistently modeling the way of Jesus and pointing others toward it. This text is about the choice for love. In our reading, Jesus isn't plucking the heads of grain himself. His disciples are. His affirmation, sanctioning even, of their activity is the outward-facing service and support needed in that moment. If we imagine the disciples, his companions, as being hungry, Jesus says they are allowed to eat. Later, the man with the withered hand should and does receive healing. Jesus, moment by moment, case by case, is making the choice that leads to life. Fueled by the petty legalism of their time, the Pharisees, however faithful they may be, have got it all wrong. Wholeness of life is always the goal, and that might look like granting permission or access, or facing opposition, standing up in the center of the heated argument, to speak above and beyond the loudest voices, to offer the gift of any manner of healing. 
Ultimately, Jesus wants us to be merciful. He weighs or judges each situation through mercy's lens. He goes beyond the situation to the person that sits at its center, saying, yes, you are always permitted to receive any good I can give you. Jesus' heart is always for humanity and presses us to consider if our inflexibility, our rules, make things more difficult than they have to be. In the creation and keeping of rules, we sometimes elevate customs above the well-being of the whole. We ignore an ethic of love which yearns for, even demands liberation, life-giving service and opportunities that center the care and keeping of all humankind, of all of God's creation. Our hearts harden, our minds close, we resist Jesus. We resist his way of love. And with a stubborn silence, we resist the dream of God. And so this is what angers Jesus. This is what grieves him. And I get it because I'm angry too. And I bet you are as well. Three weeks ago, Israel seized the vital Rafah crossing, potentially collapsing the flow of critical aid to the country and increasing the likelihood of a full-blown famine. We've heard our current president diminish the horror of the events in Gaza, refusing to label it a genocide. I'm not sure what to call such large-scale destruction and acts perpetrated against a particular population, but he wants us to know that what we're witnessing is not genocide. Our young people are, if not in word, in deed, being challenged in their right to reject their school's continued funding of this war. They demand, and rightfully so, divestment. And lastly, our 45th president was just convicted, judged guilty of all 34 counts of falsifying business records. He is still eligible to become our next president. Mind you, as a felon, he can't vote, but he can be the leader of our country. So you better believe it. I'm angry. Things just are not the way they should be. And we know the way they should be, but they just aren't that way. I'm talking now about anger. Anger, justifiable abhorrence, righteous indignation, not quick-tempered, impulsive rage, because I can be there, but I'm talking about anger of the long and evenly placed and paced breath, an anger that doesn't seethe or stew, but is moved, energized towards hopeful and life-giving action. This is the kind of anger I want to center today. Our reading today makes space for anger and models for us how to move through it. What we see in Jesus' response to our rebellion is mercy, is grace, is the choice for loving action. So we're going to have lots of opportunities to put this into practice in the coming months. You know that. You feel that. All of it. Life is hard and it is happening fast. The important thing is how we respond. So again, I'm thinking about the slow and paced breath. The slow and paced breath and the meditation before angry response. What will we center as our driving force? And will we let that fuel our peaceful resistance, our actions? So give yourself a little pinch, right? Take that deep breath, because this is where we are. What will you say to the young person who needs an opportunity that you can provide? What will you say to the homeless man at your gate? What will you do with your vote? There's always this wrestling between theory and reality, always the negotiation be between our assumptions and what is happening, the demand of life in the present moment. How are we to respond? With courage and an authority given to us by Jesus, we can shape our lives. We can remake the world. If we're awake and if we're paying attention, we can help change it. 
if our disappointment and rage, our anger about the way things are, doesn't hinder us. So we've got lots to be angry about, but we can't let that stop us. We can't become numb or worse yet, act with revenge as our goal. Not if we want to experience peace, the beauty of the common ground. We'll remember this, Jesus' preaching tour, the healings and miracles, the growing crowds, and with it, the challenges to his ministry, the voices of demons, the perpetual questioning, the escalating sense of danger and violence, adversaries and challenges to his ministry at every turn. It is a time of choosing sides and an increasing sense of vulnerability. We can remember this and then imagine the need for flexibility, for pliable hearts, for an openness to change, and the pursuit of what is life-giving above those rigid and inflexible laws that we create. And so, please, St. Peter's, my brothers and sisters, the goal, the call right now is to resist the tendency towards numbness. Don't get stuck. When you read the news here and have to filter through the alternative facts and misinformation and finally land on the truth of this crooked and sometimes painfully unjust system, let anger fuel your practice of hopeful action. Don't let anger lay your vision to waste. Use it, hear and understand anger's possibilities, that anger that heat, that energy can be used for something greater. Anger, anger can mobilize us for good. Anger can be constructive and healing. A righteous anger can be the seedbed for our peaceful and prayerful resistance. Jesus uses it as a powerful tool here. For him, anger fuels and releases the full power of love in the immediate and the eternal in that vein. We've committed to 40 days of prayer through June 29th, and you can join us daily using a series of prayers found on the website. And additionally, you can join us in person on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, where we begin our prayer time in the body, engaging in 30 minutes of yoga-based movement to keep us present and alive, to strengthen our inner resources, and we follow that with corporate and intercessory prayer. We'll also journey with other local churches on Saturday, June 15th to pray with our feet, walking together to the cathedral steps for a time of prayer. This is also another opportunity to raise much needed funds for the Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza. These are prayerful actions. These are prayerful practices. These are the things we can do when people are hungry, are suffering from illness and disease in the face of rising opposition, the stories of conflict and war, dehumanizing brutality, blatant and unyielding injustice, when faced with the multiple and many layered crises of our time, may any anger we feel be transformative. May it be cathartic. May it be liberating for ourselves and for others. May it fuel and release the full power of love. And let us be guided by that. Let us be guided by that. Take that deep breath. And just settle yourself in your seat for a moment of stillness. We can use anger we can use it. We can use it to release the full energy of love. So in that comfortable seat, just for a moment, be in your body and think. Think with your mind, your soul, your body. Think with your full and whole self. Think about where we are 
this cusp, this brink, this edge. And then imagine with me the possibilities. What could lie ahead if we'd stay awake, if we'd use the energized sense of anger that could propel us into loving action? Take another deep breath. So to do this, what do you need to know right now? And how can you be guided by it? Can you let any anger you feel be the mobilizing force to embolden you with the power of love and have that guide your next most faithful steps? If you haven't already, place your hands at your heart. If your eyes aren't closed, maybe close them and just trust the space in this moment, in this gathering of people, followers of the way of Jesus. Discern the time. Our desired goal the need for something more, something different, new words. Let's be guided by God's spirit of change and newness. And in that, ask for and take what you need. Give what you have and what you can. Come forward, stretch out your hand, open a door, invite someone in. And then consider the cost of doing nothing. Take another deep breath. Each of us must find and help make a new way forward. It is upon us. It is ours to do.